the question is, you know, this trial was phase two. I think it did not, if I'm not mistaken, meet its primary endpoint, which mm -hmm. is overall survival. Is that correct? No, it was, it was they were looking at response rate. Response rate, a, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 And they, they, they didn't they had meet a, that. Yeah, they had a qualification response rate, but it's hard to have, you know, a primary endpoint, uh, you know, defined in such a manner mm -hmm. uh, because they had a range of response rate. Overall, 20% of patients had a response. Duration of response was good. PFS looks good. This is an active agent. So you're the FDA, okay? You see this data now. You've, you've given them an accelerated <laughs> designation. What do you do with it at this point in time, knowing that there are other trials? And maybe, Joyce, you can summarize what those trials. There are other abemacyclib trials now coming down the pike. So, you know, there's abemacyclib plus letrozole. Oh, mm -hmm. Electron, yeah. And abemacyclib plus fulvestrin. Mm -hmm. And you know, targeted agents. Mm -hmm. And the abemacyclib plus surgery targeted agent. And mm -hmm. hopefully some of those trials will announce in the next probably year, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe Monarch 2, for example. You know, so what do you do? Put it, you on the spot. It's a, it's a tough one. It is a tough well, one. The FDA, the FDA has uh, defined the requirements to achieve breakthrough designation. Yeah. And a result like this would fit that eligibility. Right, and I agree with you. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm curious well, what the other know, panel members well, The FDA discussant um, at, the, at the sessions, Correct. It was, it was, she was excellent. And, and they also recognize that there is some subjectivity that goes along with this. Um, but I think to Kim's point, to have a targeted drug, um, a single agent, therapeutic intervention that is active in this setting has not been shown outside of hormone receptor positive and outside of chemotherapy. So I think they'll have to evaluate that and evaluate the fact that they it didn't quite meet their definition of what was an effective response uh, criteria. Right. So I think that's a discussion. But, you know, clinical benefit rate is so important. And we know that um, from a clinical standpoint that having prolonged stable disease or response is the same thing in terms of your overall outcome. So response is not the best um, measure in the um, endocrine therapy setting. And so we go back to the accelerated approval of capecitabine, you know, back in 1998, you know, with you a 19% right, right. response right. rate. Um, clinical benefit rate wasn't really on the radar screen, survival of 12.8 months. And um, it was met that unmet medical need. And I guess that's the debatable point here. I think it's an unmet need because, and I really want the drug. So I'm, I really am hoping that it'll get approved. I hope so, too. Apparently, they have an expanded access program that's starting very soon anyway. But nonetheless, that's good. you know, hopefully it'll be approved at some mm -hmm. point. I think the real yeah. strength from a regulatory perspective is it's not like this is the only study we're going to have with this drug. So we saw this with pertuzumab in particular, where a larger registration randomized studies have been completed and so they granted a conditional approval. So I would hope that that would be the case here. We all know expanded access is valuable to patients, but it would be better, I think, just to have the drug while we're waiting for the other studies to report out. Right. So going back, there's a third one out now. There's ribociclib, you know, which actually has a whole series of trials that we'll announce. Any thoughts on ribociclib? Sunil? Yeah, so ribociclib, um, so the uh, Mona Lisa series of trials sort of cover the ribociclib um, spectrum, uh, Mona Lisa II, um, is, um, has met its primary endpoint of PFS. So this is um, going to be reported later this year. Um, so I think we are seeing this class effect now uh, with uh, palbocyclib now, uh, ribocyclib being positive, and abemocyclib, which has a unique mode of action compared to the other two. Um, so this is an exciting time in a hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer. And I think, you know, Kim mentioned sort of near doubling to go from 14 months to 25 months PFS in the first line setting. Right. It is shifting things. Yeah. Um, it is shifting things dramatically. And, um, and I think it re really remains to be seen how we can take this and how do we identify those patients early on to potentially potentiate this effect in adjuvant setting, in the new adjuvant setting. And I think those are the kind of questions that we need to start discussing now. You know, the fact that the control arm had such prolonged PFS suggests that this happened in a population <coughs> that is very hormone dependent, very uh, endocrine sensitive, and probably um, suggests that we should consider this in all patients yeah. and uh, Carlos, as first line yeah. in the metastatic setting yeah, and not that was, wait. That was the discussion I think we had in the hallway as Correct. well to say, what is the role of single agent endocrine therapy now? You know, where does single agent well, that's, endocrine therapy? Well, let's get to that now. Yeah. So we have yeah. Falcon. <laughs> so we have Falcon. Yeah. Okay. Which has not, at least at the time of this talk, time of our discussion here, has not formally announced. But apparently there was a press release, 
um, suggesting that it had a survival advantage as a single agent. PFS. A PFS advantage. Okay. So where, where do we put that now? Where do we put single agent endocrine therapy? And so the Falcon is the uh, front line a study right. of fulbestrin versus an astrazole, right. you know, and um, it was uh, following up on the first trial and showing, uh, again, the thing about those patients, and uh, this is really the crux of the matter, I think, is that they're totally endocrine therapy naive. And that's where I struggle. I will tell you that I agree with you, you know, the um, Paloma 2 with the 14.5 months median PFS in the control arm says it's an endocrine therapy sensitive patient population, but these de novo metastatics that present with a very, very minor amount of bone disease, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, we'll have to wait for the Falcon actual results to see. I'm not yet convinced that every single patient first line metastatic requires palbociclib. I, I'm, I'm one of those that I still want to um, see. Now, in Paloma 1, when you look at the de novo metastatics and the bone onlys, they got every bit as much benefit from the palbociclib. So I'm, I couldn't find a subset in that group that didn't, including the most endocrine therapy sensitive. But still, um, I have patients in the practice that have been, we all do, have been on first line um, endocrine therapy for de novo metastatic for five years, five plus years, you know, so there are these patients. And um, I think that we need to see, we have to wait, have to wait for the Falcon data. We want to see some biomarker data. We want to really get deep into the clinical subsets on the um, Paloma 2 data, I do, and then um, go from there. Because I think it's still an open question. Or based on Paloma 3, would you use palpocyclib or fulvestrin? Well, I would. So yeah. I think that Joyce and I are probably saying the same thing. I just feel a little bit more, you know, we've learned oh. from other targeted therapy experiments like Cleopatra, where there was a large percent of patients that got TRAS with chemo who did very well for a really long time, and yet we saw a 15.6-month survival benefit when we added pertuzumab. So when you have highly effective targeted agents, I mean, I come to it from a place, you start the fulvestrin and the palbo, and if they have untoward toxicity, you can always stop the palbo. I don't think we have any data at this point. I can't believe I'm being more aggressive than you. This is um, great. See the yeah, evolution. You know, I think that, we're also excited about targeted therapies. Because I this think is we tremendous. have other examples of where adding a, a highly effective targeted agent, even in de novo, never treated before, has improved. And Cleopatra is a good example because the majority of those women were de novo, HER2 positive. They had never seen HER2 positive. But it's a survival. Therapy. You know, that's the thing. If, I mean, yeah. if we were, I would be saluting, you know, if we had the year, you know what I mean? So we'll have to wait right. and see with longer follow up. So, 